Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot, known locally as the February Room, is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. A fly fishing guide can use the barter system for everything from wealth management to root canals. And I know many that accompany their clients on exotic locations to the far corners of the globe. Occasionally, we even get the chance to guide a fellow guide. In addition to the angling skills that they bring to the boat, a guide is going to provide some inside information about another region or some tackle or technique tidbit that I wasn't privy to. I'm also going to get a breather from the usual round of questioning such as, quote, how do we get back to the truck at the end of the day, unquote. Guides also tend to have the best fishing stories. And recently I had a chance to guide a guide from Pennsylvania and he graciously agreed to join us on the show. Rick Niles, welcome to the February Room. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's good to chat with you again. Had a had a really good time fishing with you back in early July, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk with us. Uh, let's go ahead and dive right in. Can you share an experience with us, if you would, please? Yeah, um, here in Pennsylvania, where I'm located and guide, um, we have a lot of smaller streams that are tree lined, you know, up to the banks. So we, we get tangled a lot in the trees and, and two stories came to mind here. Um, we were fishing this one stream that does hold bigger brown trout, up to 18 inches and the client caught a nice one at 15 or 16. He set the hook, we got him in, got a photo and released the fish. So we continued to fish and we were using a thing bobber and two nymphs and just Dredge in the bottom, no bugs really going on. And here he hooks like a five inch brown trout, a little wild brown trout. He sets the hook like it's a 15 incher. Well, it goes <laughs> flying up into the tree, all the way up to the thingamabobber. So this five inch fish is dangling from a tree branch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it was out of reach. That's how far up he got it. And um, <laughs> so I said, here, let me see if I can get him down. And I'm pulling and pulling and pulling. And since he had it, oh, wrapped around all the way up at the thingamabobber, we were in some heavy, <laughs> heavy leaders, you know. And so I'm pulling and pulling. And, well, the fish stayed up there in my welded loop on my fly line. That's how, that's how wrapped it wrapped. <laughs> so, so it was still attached to the rod. It was still attached to the rod, obviously. So yeah, I mean, I had the fly line. I didn't have the leader, the thingamabobber, the two nymphs, and the fish dangling. <laughs> so <laughs> so hopefully a kingfisher or something like that didn't get hooked up on him. So you couldn't get the fish down at all. It just it stayed in the tree with part of your part of your uh, fly line attached to it. Oh yeah, the, the, leader. Whole, the whole leader all the way up to the fly line because the welded <laughs> loop on the fly line broke. So, you know, there's a whole rig sitting up there in the tree. So, yeah, could you uh, could you imagine stumbling across that brown trout skeleton hanging in a tree with an entire thingamabobber <laughs> and uh, and leader <laughs> attached to it? Yeah, I mean, it, you, you think about it, I hooked a... I broke a, fit, a fly off on a fish in the morning, and that evening I, I ended up back there because it was near the car, and I caught that fish and got my fly back. I mean, there's you did, yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's yeah, pretty cool. You just never know. No, that reminds me of a story my dad's old buddy told me. He was fishing on the Deschutes River, and uh, he hooked himself in his hand, 
and he couldn't get the couldn't get the fly out, so he just left it there, and and continued fishing. And uh, and incidentally, he had he had scraped the back of his hand off about a week before on a belt sander. Uh-huh. So he gets done fishing and he gets back to, he's walking back to his truck and he encounters another angler and he asks him, you know, oh, how was the fishing? Blah, blah, blah. What'd you get him on? And he showed him the fly in his palm. And the guy kind of looked at it and said, huh, do you always keep your flies stuck in your hand like that? Yeah. And he flipped his hand over and he said, no, I usually use this side, but it gets kind of worn out this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you talk about a stuck fly. Well, I was going to mention later on that we had Chris Wood, the CEO of Trout Unlimited. I had him come up and we did an auction to fish with him as a fundraiser. Well, he was getting a rod out of the car and we had zebra midges on and he hooked himself in his finger with a zebra midge. But I wasn't there when that happened. He was in my other guide's car. So we're, me and another gentleman, the president of Pennsylvania TU, we started walking down the trail and these guys aren't showing up and showing up and they finally show up. And here my guide did the uh, fly line thing, trying to get this small zebra midge out and he couldn't get it out. So they said to me, said, can you get this out? And I said, yeah, give me your hand. (laughs) And I just ripped it out. You know, you push down and pull away and and like you're using the fly line. And Chris said, well, that was easy. I said, hey, you're just one of a thousand fish this year that got on. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, I've, I've never fished in Pennsylvania and I've only really spent any time there one time many years ago at a fly fishing show in the dead of winter. Um but I believe you referred to it as uh, the Montana, the, uh, the Montana of the East. Can you kind of uh, paint a picture for us about uh, the type of fishing opportunities you guys have out there? Well, we have a very diverse state as far as trout fishing goes. I mean, if you start in the east, you have the Delaware River and the upper Delaware, the east branch, west branch, and the main stem for many miles uh, holds wild rainbows and wild browns. And because it's a big river system, of course, the fish get big. I just happened to be up there last Monday with a friend and we drifted it. We did okay. Um, we got some sulfurs PMDs and we were catching them on that. But then it slowed down uh, because of the high sun. You know, you know how it is. And but you have this very, I mean, it's considered the best water in the east right there at the Delaware. And as you work, to the west side of the state, I mean, we have more running water than any state. So we have more more trout water. Now, we're not like Montana. There's a lot of posted water, uh, private club water, uh, but there is there is enough water to, that you have access to to trout fish. And you have everything from little creeks like where I live up I live in the headwaters of the one stream and there's five streams that form it and they're only eight to ten feet wide and so you can fish for wild browns in there and brook trout native brooks um, uh, wild rainbows are more in the limestone creeks um, you will have wild rainbows but you do find them every once in a while But as you get to central PA, as you work your way over, you have the Lehigh River, you have the Lackawanna River up in the Northeast, uh, Lehigh in the Allentown area. Then you have the Susquehanna, which is an unbelievable smallmouth fishery, that in the Juniata River. Um, And then when you hit State College, right into the center of the state, uh, that's where I do most of my guiding. Some of the best trout water in the East Coast is out there. Penn's Creek, Spring Creek. Uh, Spring Creek has the highest population of trout, wild trout, in the state. So, and there's 17 miles of fishing out there. So, then you have the upper Pine Creek Valley, the Allegheny River, and as you get down towards Pittsburgh, it kind of fizzles out, but then you get up towards Erie, and you actually have some 
uh, tributaries where salmon and steelhead run out of the lake. So, I mean, it, there, there's a lot of fishing to be had here. That's amazing. And, and I draw people in. Um, I booked some people just the other week. They're coming in from Minnesota. And I had people last year from Wisconsin, Kentucky, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, um, so uh, Connecticut. So, you know, people are traveling into Pennsylvania to do fishing. So. Yeah, it's a destination state uh, like Montana. Well, it's becoming one. And what about, uh, so you said, you mentioned you drifted the, the Delaware. Is, mm -hmm. So on that river, you can float it and fish out of the boat, kind of like we do here? Yeah, it's basically the same thing, but you know, the, the flies you're using um, are totally different. You're not using hoppers up out there. Uh, there's really no hopper fishing. There is stone flies as a really good stone fly hatch if you can catch it. Um, the problem up there is you could hit the stone fly hatch one day in this one stretch and there the next day not one will come off. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it, and it's a very, um, how should I say, a short hatch, they'll come off for about two hours and then they stop. But most of the fishing up there, they have the green drake, they have the PMD sulfurs and caddis. They would be your primary with some March Browns and Hendrickson's and great foxes. Um, so it, they, it has all the diverse hatches of what you have here in the East. So. And your guide service is called Sky Blue Outfitters, and right. you've been in business since uh, 1999. Yeah. Um, can you kind of speak to your journey um, en route to becoming a guide and an outfitter? Yeah, I mean, I started fly fishing back in high school, and I really enjoyed it. I got away from it a little bit, and then I got back into it. And what happened, I, was, I had a regular job, just, you know, you can't, hey, here in the East, it's tough to be a full-time guide. Guide. But uh, previous to starting guiding, I was in sales. So I would take my clients out and that never fly fished and have them teach them and have them catch fish, you know, on a fly rod for the first time. And I saw that enjoyment and how excited I got when they got a fish that I accomplished something. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to start a guide service and slowly build it up as I get closer and closer to retirement. So I started in 99 um, and with its growth, I decided to form Sky Blue in 2002, three years later, because I started running trips to the Adirondacks and then here locally. Um, and one thing that sets us apart is that we have a seven, uh, seven member staff and we all have different skill sets like i'm known for dry fly fishing dave allball is known for he's considered the best wet fly guide in this state uh, dave rock rock casting instructor uh champion won casting competitions and he's he's been in uh competition with george daniels as partner and they have won uh, Euro Nymph, well, they were Euro Nymphing tight line and drop shotting, and they did very well and won the tournament. Um, then I have Brian Shoemaker, he's my smallmouth guide on the Susquehanna. I have Taylor Helbig, he's, um, he's a nymphing guy, he's an all around uh, fly fisherman, but he was taught by George Daniel on how to nymph, and uh, so he's really dialed in on that that method. So um, then I have Bill Nolan, he drifts to Lehigh and he's an instructor. And um, then I have Derek Everly um, in Lancaster and he's a casting instructor and all round guy. So I, I, I got a really good team put together. I built it up as we went along and built the business up. And now I'm doing this full time now. So um, I'm enjoying it. I run trips to Montana. We've been trying to get up to Labrador. We had a scheduled trip last year. Canceled this year. Canceled. Now it's scheduled for next year. I have a group of 10 going up there. So for Pike and for Big Brookies. 
And then of course I come out there to Montana. Now I'm coming out instead of once a year, uh, twice a year. And then I, the one thing that sets us apart here in the state again is I do package trips. I have a farmhouse on a creek in the state college area. And I do one night, two night, and mostly three night packages of lodging, food, and guiding. So you just show up with your license and your gear, and we take it from there. We, we take you out fishing wherever the best fishing is. Within the hour, we got 20, 25 streams we can fish. So there's never been an issue with us finding fishable water. Cool. And is a guide and an outfitter the same thing in Pennsylvania as far as licensing? No, uh, there is no outfitter license. You're a guide. So you just need a guide license. And um, of course, you can work independently or with a shop or something. There, A guide is not required to work for an outfitter like it is in Montana. Gotcha. And now a brief message from our sponsors. High performance graphite shouldn't break the bank. Check out the Tamer brand of fly rods for composite developments available in five, six, and eight weight. An unbelievable value at $199, Tamer four-piece fly rods deliver smooth cast and precise presentation. Our Tamer kits include a fly lab pulse reel and weight forward fly line. A river ready kit for under 300 bucks. Go to cd-fishing.us or visit a CD dealer in Idaho, Montana, or Wyoming. And remember to go fishing. Can you tell me about um, some of your work that you've done with Trout Unlimited? I know you've been really involved with that organization for, for quite a while, and you recently accepted a position um, uh, for a new post with TU. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been involved with Trout Unlimited, I don't know, 30 years maybe here locally. Um, Pennsylvania has the most members and the most chapters of any state. Uh, so it's a very active state. One of the key things they try to do is, is do stream improvements to create more oxygen and channelized water to keep it deeper and cooler. And also mine recovery. You know, there's a lot of mining here in the eastern and northwest side of the state um, for coal. And so there's a lot of mining acid and that's been a uh, a key focus on uh, trying to clean that up and it's working out uh, it just takes time and money to get it done. So as far as my involvement, we're a Trout Unlimited business and we were honored with that you know, eight, ten years ago, 20, I can't even remember. So um, and then they elevated us to a gold level uh, because of our fundraising and donations and you know, support we give them. And yes, I am. And like I mentioned earlier, Chris Wood, the CEO, he, I've been after him to come up and fish and he wanted to, and then we, he finally decided he could get away last year. And we did it as a fundraiser. We auctioned off uh, fishing with Chris a couple nights, a couple days and a couple nights of lodging. And we raised a good amount of money. Um, for Pennsylvania Trout Unlimited. So, and then you said I accepted a position. Yeah, um, we're just working out the details, but I am now going to be vice president of the Southeast region for Trout Unlimited, which I will not oversee. I will support seven chapters in the Philadelphia market area, Philadelphia, Allentown, Reading. So that's Southeast uh, corner. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I have more time now and things are going good. So, Well, awesome. Well, congratulations on the new role. Um, I'm surprised that our paths never intersected before. Uh, I produced the TV show for TU for four or five years and we did uh, multiple episodes in Pennsylvania, but I never got a go on those on those particular shoots. I know we did one on Spring Creek, um, the Latort, and if I named off the people that we worked with, I'm sure you recognize those names. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, somehow somehow we missed each other out there. But I'm gonna have to come out there and and go poke around with you one of these days. 
sounds like really interesting water. Always looked like really an interesting place to go spend some time and, and road trip it. Yeah, the only issue is like now, I mean, trout fishing is very limited to either limestone creeks or springs bubbling up out of the ground or uh, cold water dam releases. So right now it's a little slow. I was just up in the mountains this past weekend. I was fly fishing for largemouth. So um, cool. Just throwing frogs around, you know, lumber and and lily pads and things like that. Trying to get some largemouth. So, so right now it's it's kind of slow, but the smallmouth fishing is it all turned on with poppers and clouser minnows. Oh yeah, that's that smallie fishing is so much fun and lar- I love bass fishing, all bass fishing. Um, my wife just sent me a photo last night. She's she's at the family cabin in Wisconsin and. Um, and uh, she caught a pretty nice bass last night. She was at, they're they're smart in this lake that the cabin's on. They get they get fished to quite a bit. Um, and uh, the her godfather who lives on the lake gave her a fly at dinner time, and she went out and caught a nice fish on it last night. So she was she was thrilled. So I'm looking forward to to getting out there here in a few days and and targeting some bass. They're they're uh, they're so much fun. They're just a smallmouth are a great game fish. Oh yeah, they're they are fun. They fight. So it's and like I said, the Susquehanna is probably well. It's had its up and up and downs over the past ten years. There's been some issues there, but um, last year was kind of a slow year. This year's been very good. Two years ago. 2020 it was very good last year for some reason it was it was just not fishing as good uh we think a lot of the bigger fish moved up to the juniata river uh, but now they spread back down into the susquehanna so fishing's good and do they coexist with the trout pretty well well there's no trout in the susquehanna or the juniata now there's the little juniata river but that's a trout river um, the little J, that's the one that you refer yeah, to as the little J. Correct. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, that's my one guide lives right out there on the little J. So um, we're spread around the state so we can cover everything. But um, yeah, there, like I said, there's so much fishing. I mean, just within my house here, and I live in a, well, I live out in the country, but I live between Reading and Allentown. I mean, within an hour, I could. Oh my word! Probably forty trout streams. Holy cow! I would say five within a five mile radius of my house. And, then, and they're small. They're small. You're not going to get twenty inch fish out of them. You're going to get six to eleven inch every once in a while, twelve to fourteen. But um, uh, there's there's just so much water here now. Again, they're kind of warm right now. They're a little low. So you just let them you let them go till till the fall. Right, right. So Allentown could make an argument for Trout Town USA. It sounds like. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but um, more like State College out there if they want to do it. Um, I, like I said, within an hour there, there is just so many fisheries we could go to. Do you guys have any pike around you? You know, just in some of the lakes, muskie actually is more uh, prominent here. Um, Down in the southeast region here, they they stock tiger muskies that can't spawn. And then there's wild muskies around in the rivers and the bigger lakes. Uh, The pike fishing is more in the northwest. And then we have a lot of pickerel fishing up in the northeast. In fact, just... Two and a half weeks ago, I was up there with a buddy. We went out, and we were largemouth and pickerel fishing, and we boated over a hundred fish. The pickerel were just turned on. They were just, you know, they're small pike, anywhere from twelve inches to twenty inches. But hey, anything on a fly rod is fun. Yeah, well, um, when when you were out here, we had what I thought was a really good day of dry fly fishing on on the river, and then. Um, and then you uh, you signed on to go pike fishing, and we had a we had a yeah. pretty good day on the Pike Lake too. 
Yeah, we caught a couple dozen. Yeah, yeah, we did. We did get a couple dozen. That was, yeah, numbers-wise, I think that was the best day I had all year. Well, we had quality fishermen. <laughs> Schol <laughs> and scholars and gentlemen always make a difference, yeah. But I'll tell you what, Steve still talks about the time you were yelling at me. He liked that because he's <laughs> me yelling at clients all the time and you yelled at me. That dog, that Well, dog. you know how it is, man. You just... Uh, you can't get away from it sometimes. I do the same thing to my wife. I, I really try to resist it uh, with her and with uh, when I go fishing with my friends. I had took one of my oldest buddies and his kid the other day. We were bass fishing and uh, and I, you know, they were missing so many fish and I was having such a hard time just keeping my cool. <laughs> there was a couple of really nice small mouth and it's like, oh, just set the F and hook, would you please? <laughs> well, I had I had two clients this year. We were dry fly fishing. A fish came up and ate their fly and they didn't set the hook. And I, you know, so I quick said, you know, set the hook. And they looked at me, both clients, Two different clients, two different places. They just looked at me and said, I didn't oh, feel it. yeah, God. There you go. It's like, yeah, no, this is visual. It's like a thingamabob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not going to feel it. Only you're nymphing in streamers and wet fly fishing do you feel stuff. So, um, anyway, it's, it, you know, we all have them. Sure. Um, it, it, it's have to, you know, they're beginners. And that's just how you... People don't, you know, I come out there, I'm hiring guides because I'm bringing a group of clients out from Pennsylvania. But, you know, here, generally speaking, you're getting hired here in Pennsylvania because they want to learn where to go and how to fish. So, you know, you're not hiring. I don't get too many what I would call experts. Right. Um, you know, I'm getting novices, beginners, people that never even held a fly rod. I was... I was lucky I guided here locally on my one stream and the one gentleman, he never, he wanted to get into fly fishing. He never fly fished. Well, he was doing really good. He never, and I said to him, I, do you ever spin fish? He goes, I never fished in my whole life. And he caught on so fast. I was just so happy for him. He caught a fish nymphing. He caught a fish on a dry and I put on a woolly bugger and he caught a fish on the streamer. So he experienced all three. So once he caught one on a nymph, I had him swing a woolly bugger so he could see that technique. And then we had some fish working. So he, you know, that, that, that's good because a lot of the new clients that want to get into fly fishing, they, they bring some conventional casting habits with them that they need to bring. So, but. Man, I had a I had a guy a, a month ago, um, and uh, and hopefully he doesn't listen to this. Well, if he does, uh, he'll he'll know he'll know exactly who I'm referencing. But uh, he uh, he was a tarpon fly fisherman, and that's all he had ever really done. And uh, and you know he could cast, but his cast was so aggro he was just breaking flies off mid cast, right and left. Like, I mean, this guy lost. 50 or 60 flies in two days. What was he doing? He, his his cat. Yeah. He's double hauling and, and just overcasting and casting so aggressively. Um, and he didn't break all those off just casting. He broke a bunch of them off casting. He broke a bunch of them off on fish. Anytime he got snagged, he'd pop up right off just cause everything. He was a huge guy to a former football player, a big, strong guy. And he could cast a mile, but uh, but the trout fishing uh, was really flummoxed him. Um, and uh, you know, the the second day I had him, the other gentleman in the boat was an experienced trout fisherman, and you know he did very well. And and the other guy just just struggled, but at least then it was kind of in his head, like, okay, wait a minute, I'm doing this all wrong. Um, you know, he didn't. You know how they a guy just gets kind of preconceived notions in his mind. Like, um, oh, I know how to fish, you know, I've been doing this my, my whole life. I'm a good fisherman. 
but wow. but trout fishing and tarpon fishing could not be more opposite and like you mentioned you're almost better off starting off with somebody on a total clean slate than somebody that's bringing a bunch of uh muscle memory uh you know pertinent to, to hook a 100 pound fish and casting 80 feet every time <laughs> yeah rick we had a phenomenal day of dry fly fishing on the lower clark fork yeah, we had our best fishing this past trip on Clark Fork. So I, I've i always been a big fan of Clark Fork. So whether it's, you know, above town or, or below town. I never fished, you know, in town. But we had, uh, we caught our biggest fish and our most big fish on Clark Fork. And, that, and a lot of that's a product of the work that, you know, TU and other groups have done um, to restore the tributaries and and clean up that river and uh, just, you know, overall improve the cold water habitat down there, the, the West Slopes in particular, that native native species of trout that requires cold, clear water. Yeah. And, you know, we have that issue here. You know, the headwaters, to me, should be taken care of first. Because if you don't solve the problem in the headwaters, you're never going to solve the problem in the main waters. So, um, you know, if you need to keep cows out of the headwaters, uh, if you need to do deflectors to get more oxygen for the spawning and just for summer habitat, you know, things like that. So it's, um, you know, that's one of the key things is getting the headwaters right and then the main water that's formed by the headwaters, everything will fall into place. So, Well, Rick, I've taken up enough of your time. Um, how can folks contact you and, uh, and Sky Blue Outfitters? What's the best method? Well, I mean, we have contact forms on the website. You can see what we're all about on the website. So it's skybluoutfitters.com. Um, it's not hard to find us. Um, my name's Rick Niles, N-Y-L-E-S. You can just Google my name, I'll come up. So um, that would be the easiest way. I can give you my phone number. It's 610-987-0073. And um, you can give me a call and then we can uh, have a conversation. Well, great, Rick. Well, thanks again for chatting with me today. And um, I look forward to seeing you here in a month or so uh, over on the Missouri. Yeah, I hope. Well, I'll get to drift with you one day. I'll make sure. So. Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns. And if you have one to spend, shoot us an email at info at the February room dot com. The February room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February room, and we'll see you down here next week.